Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of our Google Investing Talks. Today we have a very special guest with us here today. His name is Arnold Vandenberg. Arnold is the chairman and CEO of Century Capital Management, which he founded in 1974. Born in 1939, Arnold Vandenberg survived the Holocaust as one of Holland's hidden Jewish children. His parents both survived Auschwitz and the family immigrated to America when he was 10. These struggles led him to an extensive journey and study of things like investing as well as things like consciousness and the subconscious mind, which he believes is the key to unlocking an individual's potential. There is a quote that is often attributed to Einstein. Uh, it goes something uh, like this. Don't let your schooling interfere with your education. And Arnold, it seems, he took it to heart. He has no formal college education. It is through years of hard self-study, dedication, and more than 45 years of industry experience that he has gained his market knowledge. Prior to starting Century Management, he worked as a financial advisor for Capital Securities and John Hancock Insurance. We are so delighted to have him here in person to share his experiential wisdom, not just about investing, but also about life. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Arnold Vandenberg. I will start uh, with where I was born. I was born in Amsterdam, Holland, during the Nazi occupation of Holland. And if you look at the Google map there, you can see where we lived. Uh, we lived right down the street from Anne Frank, and some of you might have heard her story. Our family story was very much like her. Uh, my folks were hidden for about two and a half years in an attic, and they developed one major problem. The problem was that when you're hiding with two small children, I was two and a half years old, my brother was five and a half. It was difficult to go into hiding with them. But there was a bigger problem, and my parents had to make a very difficult choice. Uh, if they kept the children with them and they were caught, they would be sent to Auschwitz, which they eventually were. But the children uh, in Auschwitz, they didn't keep women and children. The minute a woman and children would come the first day, they would gasp. So it was a big risk if the children were caught with the parents. It usually meant the end of the parents. The other alternative on the choice was to send us through uh, the German lines uh, in an orphanage. And the orphanage, in order to get that orphanage, you had to take a train. And the problem with the train is they checked your passport. We didn't, being Jewish, didn't have passports. And so they had to make a fake passport. But the fake passport wasn't very good, so it was a big risk. It was just like a worst case situation. So anyway, my folks got together with the underground, the Dutch underground. And they worked out a plan where a 19-year-old girl would take me on the train, and then in front of her would be an individual who would try to keep the Nazi officer who came on the train to do the passports, keep him on the train there, keep him busy until the whistle blew, and then the officer had to get off the train. So we got on the train. The officer came on. The gentleman stood up, kept him busy. All of a sudden, the whistle blew. And as I spoke to this woman after the war, she says it was just the most dramatic moment when the whistle blew. She knew she was going to be OK. So anyway, she got me to the orphanage where I was there from about two and a half to six. And then eventually, uh, my parents were turned in by people in Holland who uh, did favors for the Germans, and they got extra food rations for that. But the thing that, that uh, really got me is the fact that this girl risked her life to save me and somebody she didn't even know. By the way, that is my family up there. I'm in the middle, and we are the only survivors out of 39 people that were living before the war. Anyway, the thing that as I grew up I really struggled with is how could this young girl risk her life for me? She didn't even know me. And how could her whole family risk their lives? They were hiding Jews and moving them back and forth. 
and the father would send his 19-year-old girl on a mission that she could end up in a concentration camp. So I thought about that for many years. I tried to figure out what would motivate somebody to do that. And the more I thought about it, I just didn't have an answer. Well, as I got older, uh, I developed some problems. I had a big anger problem. I went through years of depression. And I finally went to see a psychiatrist who helped me a great deal. And then as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, I'm going to ask him what he thinks about it. And I thought we're going to get a long dissertation on this. And he says, oh, that's very simple. I said, really? He says, sure. He said, it's all about principles. He says, these were people who were deep Christians. They had a big belief in their religion. And their principles were more important than their life. He says, so the way it works is, if you have principles that are more important in your life, you sacrifice them. If your life is more important than your principles, you sacrifice your principles. And that is true not only in life where you have to sacrifice your life, but also in business where you have to make choices that sometimes cause for sacrifices. But anyway, I just want to make this one point about the principles that in really influenced my life. Here on one side you have people who were willing to risk their life, and the other side you have people who would turn you in for an extra food ration. So just think, same people, same situation, same circumstances. One of them did this noble thing of risking their life. The other ones were willing to turn in for a matter of an extra food ration. So that really got me to thinking how crucial in life it was to have the right principle, to have something that really was a compass that guided you. And so I started thinking about it. And I was raised in Judaism, so I started studying the Jewish religion, studied all the different ideas and so forth. But I wanted to also study the other religion, and especially Christianity, because these, went, these people took such risks that I wanted to see what motivated them. So I started studying the religion. The more I studied the religions, the more I got confused. On one side, here the Jews and the Christians have been arguing for 2,000 years, and so all of a sudden, I got into the debate. I would go see a rabbi, talk to ministers, Bible scholars, Hebrew scholars, went through the whole thing. And it really started to create a problem with me, a conflict. And the conflict was, here I was raised Jewish. My parents paid a great price to be Jews. And here there were things about Christianity, their principles that I really liked. And so one day, I was sitting by myself studying away, and I thought, geez, how am I going to reconcile this? And all of a sudden, a voice flashed it through my mind. It just, not a voice, a, a thought flashed through my mind, and it said, if you want to seek the truth, you have to go wherever it leads you. And I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, you know, that's right. And the minute I thought about that, I just felt so relieved. I completely felt free. I just knew now that one of my core principles would be that irrespective of what I was studying, what I was looking for, I was going to seek the truth, and that was going to be the guiding principle. Completely relieved me. This way, I went in to study all the different religions. I learned a great deal from all of them, and all of these different things have led me to the principles that I believe in. Well, it didn't take long to test those principles. I start, after I graduated out of high school, I worked a few jobs, and I got into the insurance business. And so I was very excited about the insurance business. I thought it was a way to help people and to create my own business. And everything was going fine. And then the more I studied the business, the more I saw that certain products that the company pushed cost a lot of money, had high commissions, but wasn't necessarily the right product for most people. And the the products that I liked were very low cost, gave the most uh, for the insurance, also paid the least uh, commission. And so I figured, okay, I believe in this thing. I'm going to sell the products that I believe in. Well, after a few years of selling that, it's pretty hard to make money at these low cost products, even though they were the best. But I continued to do it because I had developed the principles that no matter what it was, I was going to do the right thing. So one day after driving all the way across town, 
I come back to the office about 9 o'clock at night, made it, barely made enough money to pay for my gas, but let alone the hours it took to drive back and forth and so forth. And I come into the office and they had a sort of a honorary thing where they honored the top person of the month. And the guy who got the top of the month was the guy who had the least ethics in the whole company. And so I thought to myself, how could this great company honor this guy when everybody pretty kind of knows the kind of situation he was in? And I was just shocked by it. I won't tell you what I did to the picture. But anyway, the next day, the next day I walked into the supervisor's office and I said, let me ask you a question. You know this ethics of this guy, right? How could you make him the top man? He says, well, Arnie, you've never owned a business, but I'm running a business, and i got an overhead. And so I need to make my overhead, because otherwise, we don't have a business, and you don't have a job. I just looked at him, and I thought, well, this is not the right place for me. I've got to leave this. Well, that was kind of a conflict that created, because... I'd worked for three years and I built up these renewals, which was part of my income. And now I was going to forfeit my renewals and I was also going to forfeit my income. And so basically I was going to be out of job. But fortunately, and in some ways unfortunately, the company had started to go into mutual funds. And I had started studying mutual fund. I was very excited about it. And so I thought, well, you know what, I'm just going to leave the company and just make the mutual fund the primary business because they're very excited about what was going on. So anyway, I thought about that, struggled with that, and the principal said, it's obvious what you have to do. So I started the mutual fund, and that is the point where I said, fortunately and unfortunately, because at the time I left the insurance business and went into the mutual funds, the market was six months away from making an all-time high. The market had been in the bull market for 20 years. It had just gone way up. The enthusiasm was just unbelievable. And just to show you what was going on, this is an article out of Barron's Magazine at the top of the market, and they said, here's all the top money managers, the people I used to go watch and sell their mutual fund and there was not a bear among them. In other words, the enthusiasm was so high that no money manager in the country was bearish. The inflation rate was down, the interest rates were down, but an important fundamental that they seemed to overlook, and I didn't have a clue of what was going on, and it turns out they didn't either, because the market eventually went down 45%, the average stock went down 75%, and my mutual funds started falling apart. So this was the beginning of my career in the stock market. And so as the market started going down and down, and the funds kept going down and down, it was just very discouraging, and I didn't have the understanding of how the market worked or the evaluation of what a company was worth and so on. And so it was just kind of like... The market kept going down, but there was no way I could evaluate it. Anyway, I decided I was going to study it and to figure out what was going on. In the meantime, the market went down for a total of six years. Now, there was one year that it, it bottomed in June of 70, and it rallied for about a year and a half, and then it came crushing down from 72 to 74. So as the market was going down and I was studying it, I started to notice a pattern. And the pattern was that certain funds did much better than others. It's not that they went up on the down market, but they were going down, but they weren't going down as much, and they reacted better when the market rallied. And I could see a noticeable difference. So I started studying those funds, and I thought to myself, I'm going to find out why it's different. And so I called the managers and I talked to the other people involved. And I finally concluded that the people who were following the value investors seemed to be doing better in this extreme downturn. So that got me interesting. I thought, well, maybe that's the better philosophy to do. So I talked to the different managers, uh, read the material. And so all of a sudden, as you start reading about value investing, 
you can't help but learn about Benjamin Graham, who was the father of security analysis, who basically developed that value situation, and whose prize student was Warren Buffett. So as I started studying it, one day I met a value investor who had been very successful, very knowledgeable about it, and he said to me, you know, Arnie, we were having dinner one night, he says, when you really break it down, the secret of understanding an individual stock is to first of all figure out what it's worth. It's just like a piece of real estate. You know, you call into brokers, they do similar studies, and you figure out kind of for square footage, the land, and so forth. And so you take the fundamentals and you learn about the company. And then the most important thing, and the only time you get to do that, is when the market is down. Uh, Benjamin Graham described the market as a manic depressive. So when it's down, I bought it in the manic state. But when it gets depressed, you get an opportunity to buy it at a discount. He said, basically, you buy it wholesale. Well, that rang a bell with me because all my life, my mom was a tremendous businesswoman. She ran my dad's business before the war, after the war, and she was just amazing. She always used to say, whenever I buy some Arnold's, you have to buy it wholesale. So I always remember it stuck in my mind. So when this value investor told me that the secret to buying a stock is to buy it wholesale or a discount, I thought, now I have found the right thing. This is for me. So I thought to myself, one day I bought a sweater. And I walk into my mom and said, Mom, how do you like my sweater? She says, oh, it's beautiful. Did you buy it wholesale? I said, Mom. You can't go into Bullock's and buy one sweater and expect to get it wholesale. She goes, nah. She was not pleased with the answer. But I got the idea that was studying the uh, value investor was the way I was going to go. So now I had the principles set up, but now I needed the philosophy. So I said, OK, I'm going to do everything I can to do this philosophy. And I used to be an I used to be a athlete. And, one of the things you learn about athletics, you got to be dedicated, focused, you never skip practice. So I set up a program to learn value investing, and I set up, I'm not going out during the nights, I'm not going to date, I was single at the time, I'm just going to focus on learning the value school of investing. And I had all the books lined up and all the pages I had to read, and every night I would chalk it off, and I was making real progress. Well, then I met this girl, and we got along real well. <laughs> And she said to me, why don't you come over Wednesday night? I'll cook you a dinner and we'll hang out. And I said, oh, no, I can't study. She, I said, I've got to study. And she said, really? I didn't know you were going to school. I said, no, I'm not going to school. I'm just studying. She said, are you studying for a test? I said, no, I'm just studying on my self-study program. She looked at me kind of funny. And she says, what are you doing, studying to be a monk? So the point I'm making is that I was very focused on it. Now, what this young girl didn't understand at the time is that the most important thing in achieving anything in life is to be totally focused. I learned that as an athlete, but I want to give you an analogy which even drives that point deeper. My dad was explaining to me what was going on in Auschwitz in the concentration camp. He said to me, you know, the most difficult thing that I ever experienced in my life, and especially in the concentration camp, is that when I went on the death march, and the death march was a situation where you had to go from Auschwitz to another camp. The camp was 60 kilometers, which is about 20 miles. He was about 85 pounds. I'm 5'8", 160 pounds. He was 5'7", and he was 85 pounds. So he was all skin and bones, everybody. So they started off in the death march, you get two slices of bread, you march for 24 hours in sub-zero weather, the snow was halfway up to your knees, and if you, your knees started to buckle, you would get so tired you'd fall down, they put a rifle butt in your back, or they whipped you, till you got up and got going, or if you didn't go, they'd just shoot you. So he said the key was that he had to really focus his mind to be able to get through that kind of a situation. And he said, what I learned by going through this death march was just incredible how powerful the mind is. And he said, you would never know how powerful it was 
until you were tested to do it. I could never do this without having to do it when your life's on the line. So he said, what I learned to do is, he says, you just, you take a step, but you lock your knees so you don't fall down because you're too tired, you're going to fall down. And he says, you had to completely clear your mind. He said, you couldn't think about how tired you were. You couldn't think about how hungry you were. You couldn't think about how cold you were. You couldn't think about the pain from the cold. You could think about nothing else. Nothing should enter your mind but to move that leg. And he said, every time I moved the leg, I really didn't think I could do another one. But by focusing on it, I just moved the leg again. And throughout the 24 hours, I kept that focus. And all of a sudden, he says, you realize you get a strength that you don't even understand. And you're able to keep going. And I said, well, what do you attribute it to? He says, it has to be part of the subconscious mind. He says, I don't have the answer to it. But I can tell you this, there is no way you could ever do it without that extreme focus. So that's the key. And so I wanted to point that out to you because that became a focal part of my program. And so as I started studying the uh, Graham philosophy and the value investing, as I started learning these things, I made that the complete focus that whatever you go in, you focus that, and of course I study uh, hypnosis, which is a good way to influence the subconscious mind, many other different programs. But I wanted to leave that with you because we all have an energy and a power within us that we don't even realize, and it's just truly, truly extraordinary. Anyway, I started my business, and just I'm going to show you the difference in contrary opinion. At the top of the market when I got in, Excuse me, everybody was wildly bullish. And the market was at 20 times earnings. And now we are with the market coming down six years, and it was a real struggle just to hang in there. But I remembered the lesson that I learned, and I just knew that if I had the right philosophy and I kept going, things would work out. Well, I got so excited about the uh, value investing that I realized when I studied the multiples, the multiples at that time, you won't believe it, we're at about an 18, 19 multiple in the market. The markets, the average stock was selling at three to five times earnings, and the big cap stocks were about eight times earnings, and they were bargained six, seven percent dividends. It was just incredible bargains. And the more I studied the value philosophy, the more I realized that we were truly at an extraordinary time in history where the market had never been that cheap, except going back to the 29 depression. So here we were 30, 40 years later, and this was the cheapest market. The only problem is I didn't have many clients. I wasn't making any money. And each month I get deeper in debt. But I had the faith that if this was truly the historical time, that eventually things would change. So then one day I come into the office, and then I see this new article, the cover of Business Week, they had all the sophisticated reasons why the market was going to stay down for the next few years. Didn't have many opportunities, and they called it the death of equity. So here at the peak of the market at 20 times, everybody was bullish, including the money managers. Now we're at the bottom of the market, and they come out with this article, the death of equities. Everybody was bearish. You couldn't talk to anybody about stocks to save your life. There was one person who was bullish. And that was Warren Buffett. And he wrote an article, or he was interviewed in Forbes in December of 74. I'll never forget it. And the only thing I remember about the article that stuck in my mind, he said, they were asking him, what do you think about what's going on, the inflation and all of this? He says, look, he said, if you're worried about recession or depression at these prices, I'm not worried about it. He says, this is the time to invest and get rich. And boy, that's what we did. And six months later, the market took off into one of the biggest bull markets that ever happened. The Dow went from about 800 to 18,000, where it is today. So that taught me a lot going through that market cycle. If you ever want to really learn value investing, you learn it going down in a down market, and you understand what value is and how value eventually might go down but it'll eventually come down, and some of the things that are not valued never come back. 
So that's an important part of the philosophy. So as I was reflecting over the time that I've been in business, and it's been 48 years now, I wanted to share with you something that would help you avoid some of the mistakes that we might have made and some of the stocks that didn't work out as well and so forth. Well, as I looked over the different ways, there's many different things that can happen. But if I looked at one theme that could help you a lot, is that debt is one of the biggest things against a business, against an individual, against countries, and worldwide. Matter of fact, it's the biggest problem today. So the problem was that we would get into stocks that were pretty good companies, had pretty decent balance sheets. They weren't over leveraged when we went in. But as they were going along, they either made an acquisition out of desperation that didn't work out, or they overpaid at the wrong time when everybody was enthusiastic. They developed products that they didn't uh, have any history on, and they spent a lot of money developing, and then the products didn't go on. But most importantly, they were people who didn't really spend most of their time thinking about how to make the business better, how to cut costs, and how to keep going. And then when the thing started going down, the mistakes that I made was that we stayed with those companies too long. We got to know the management. We got to believing in it. I'm a big believer in people. People is the thing that changed companies and changed the world. So when you get to believing in companies, and then you see them going along, but you see them not doing what they need to do, then you need to cut your losses and get out. So it's important to understand that debt is something that really takes the options away from a company. And if there's anything you could avoid there, when you see them going the wrong way, usually when companies make acquisitions, unless it's the kind of company that consistently makes acquisitions, and they do it consistently well, and they have a history and an expertise to do it, those companies will do very well. But if you see a company that very rarely makes an acquisition, and all of a sudden the business declines, and then they hope they throw a lifesaver out to buy another company, hope things will change, and then they both start going down. You get the idea. So debt is a very serious problem, not only in your personal life, but also in companies. And more importantly, let's take a look at the United States, because there is a problem there also. And I would say this. Whenever people get into financial trouble, it's usually due to the improper use of debt. And when I started Century Management, the only thing I used an American Express credit card whenever I needed to borrow some money. First of all, I didn't borrow any money. Most of, mo mostly, at first, nobody would have lent me any money in their right mind. But even as I had the opportunity to borrow money, I never did. I either worked it down to where the cost, the revenues met the cost, or I just forego the debt. I've never used debt as a way to finance a company. Anyway, if you look at the United States, as great as this country is, and I wish I could talk more about how wonderful this country is and what a great future it has, irrespective of the temporary problems. But one of the things that concerns me is that this country also uses improper use of debt. Now take a look at this chart. It took over 200 years to accumulate $7.9 trillion of debt. This is debt to GDP. It's kind of like debt to sales. In the last 10 years, we went from $8 trillion to $19 trillion, an increase of 140%. So obviously, we're not using debt in the proper way because of the fact that we've raised this much debt and certainly haven't done anything to cut costs. Now, the biggest problem facing people with debt is not only debt, but the debt service. So if you look at this chart, you can see that on the current $19 trillion of debt, we're paying $223 billion of debt service. We have a budget deficit of about $438 billion. But the deficit of, on the government's revenue, if you take the debt deficit to the revenue, it's about 13.5%. Now look what happens at the 3% line. If interest rates were to go up from 1% to 3%, you would be at $616 billion. That would give us a deficit of 831, and that would mean that the amount of deficit relative to the government's income would be 
Now, there's two rules you want to apply to a country. First of all, it should not have more than 80% debt to GDP, and their deficit should not be more than 30% of its income. Because if it is, what the central bankers of the world and all people who analyze countries realize that if you've got over 100% or over 80% debt to GDP and you've got 30% deficit on your income, if you're, make, if you're spending 30% more than you're making, there's very little chance you're going to be able to pay that debt back. But countries have an option that we don't, and that is they can print money. Well, what it means is that if you meet those two ratios, the event, and eventually your cost of your debt's going to go up because people say there's no way out but to print money. And in fact, that's what the government has been doing. Now, just to show you what the position of a government is in, they basically have an adjustable rate mortgage. Because if they were really doing the right thing right now, they would sell 30-year bonds so that they could get the 2.5% interest cost. But instead, they're rolling it over short term because the short term costs are lower. Well, it's just like having a mortgage, an adjustable rate mortgage. Let's say the mortgage payment on $500,000 is 2.3%. You got $1,900 a month payment. If you go to 5.3%, increase in 3%, the payment goes up 44%. So what's going to happen if interest rates go up, you're going to develop higher interest costs, and that's going to increase the deficit. So that is one thing temporarily that has to be resolved. Fortunately, countries can grow their way out of it if we had the right leadership and management. But that's the situation we are today, and that is a very troublesome thing. Now, if you look at worldwide, you can see the same thing going on. Everybody's saying, well, after the recession, the world is deleveraging. The world is not deleveraging. Take a look at these statistics. They have gone up every year. And so what we've done is we continue to pile up debt on an individual basis, on a company basis, and on countrywide and worldwide. And that needs to be addressed. Now let's take a look at where we are today in the market. I am showing you a chart that shows the uh, uh, inflation rate and the P.E. multiple. And this is a very important thing to understand and for you to watch for. Right now, what is the contrary opinion? Everybody believes that deflation is the biggest problem in the world. And it is. But at the end of deflation comes potential inflation. And nobody's talking about it. Nobody's thinking about it. But you need to watch it because whatever you don't expect usually happens on a contrary opinion basis. The most contrary opinion you could have is that you can expect inflation because the Fed has been trying desperately to create inflation. They have not been able to do it. So if it does happen, this is what's going to happen to the market. So what I'm showing you now, and I'll explain the value line index, but I'm using a value line index for this chart. And you can see that we are in the 1% to 2% inflation. That is where we are today. And the P is around 1770 to 18 times earnings. Now, here's the sweet spot. The sweet spot in inflation is 2 to 3%. So you can see that you get the highest multiple when you got 2 to 3% inflation, actually 2.5%. And the reason is that means the economy is strong, everything is going well. Interest rates are extremely low, and stock markets are way up. So the ideal thing is if the world comes together and we get a little more inflation, which is a good thing, but too much is disastrous, then we could conceivably go from the 18 to the 20, and that would be the ultimate. Now, look what happens if inflation comes and it goes from the 3 to 4, 5, and over. If you go to the 4 to 5, the multiple drops from 20 to 14. That's a 30% drop instantly. And if you go to 5 or 6%, you're going to go down to a multiple of 10. So this market has the potential, if inflation starts to perk up and the Fed doesn't act properly, you could have a market that goes down dramatically. I'm not predicting inflation. I'm only suggesting that you watch for it. could be years away. I don't know. But it's something to be concerned about. Now, let me show you something a little on history that I thought you would appreciate knowing because most people don't realize how subtle it 
is when inflation starts. Now, remember that chart I showed you, not a bear among them, everybody was bullish? You know why they were bullish? That it was at the sweet spot. We had 2.76% inflation. We had reasonable interest rates. We had a strong economy. How could you not be bullish? The only reason you shouldn't have been bullish is because the multiples were way too high. It's like Benjamin Graham said, price determines your return. No matter how good a company is, no matter how good the situation is, if the valuation is too high, eventually something's going to take it down. And sure enough, this is what took it down. In January of 73, you had a 2.76% inflation. One year later, just one year later, the inflation went from 2.76 to 4.93. It almost doubled in a year. One more year later, that's two years, and the interest rates went from 2.76 to 11%. And so you had a market that went from 20 times earnings down to 7, 8, 9, and 10. And that created this disastrous bear market. And that's what I went through at the time. So keep in mind that inflation is one of the biggest enemies to stock prices because stock prices are affected by interest rates. And obviously, interest rates are affected by inflation. So let's look at the next chart. And this is my favorite one indicator. If you needed one indicator to give you the pulse of the market to tell you where it is, if I would have understood this indicator in 1968, I would not have been caught up in this market. So here is the value line. The reason I use the value line in the S&P is because the value line has several features that I think are really much better. First of all, it's 1,700 stocks instead of 500. It gives you a cross-section of the market, which is much better than just the S&P, which are mostly big caps. The second thing is that it's a median PE, not an average. And so by a median PE, it sorts out all the distortion that happens when you have an average. And the beauty about this thing is that if you look over the 40 years that I've been in the business, or 48 years, you can see that the bottoms of the market irrespective of how bad things get, is about 10 times earnings on the value line. And it's only happened four times. You can see it in the chart. The beauty about being able to take the top, the tops have never been more than 20 times earnings, and the tops have always also been four times. So you have a good history of knowing that when the market, the value line gets down to 12 times earnings, it's about 25% about the worst case. That's a good time to be buying stocks. And you know, when it gets to the 17 to 18 times, it still has a little bit to go, but you need a perfect world. And if you don't get a perfect world, well, it could be going down. Now, one thing on the chart that's really interesting, you look at the left side of the chart, and you can see the low point. That was the time when the interest rates went from 2.76 to over 13%. And so you can see that those stocks in that, that's the only exception on the inflation situation, is the fact that the stocks went down to an average of 7.6, and they went as low as 3 and 4. And I remember in 74, sitting there agonizing, I had 25 to 30 stocks lined up. They're all selling between 3 and 7 times earnings, and I just couldn't decide which one to buy. This one's a little better balance, this a little bit, this a little bit, back and forth. All, all you had to do was throw a dart, and they all worked well. So you don't need to be in, it's kind of like they say, in a bull market, in a bear market, you don't want an analyst, and in a bull market, you don't need one. So when stocks are cheap, you really can buy them at the right price. Okay, and, and what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the two areas that I think are worth your while to look into. I don't see too many opportunities in the stock market, although there are individual sectors and individual stocks that are reasonable. They're not dirt cheap, but they're reasonable. But the areas that are exciting me today are the energy markets and the gold markets. And let's take energy first. As you know, in energy, we had a $140 oil price. Everybody that had a drilling rig went out and drilled for oil. We created this massive surplus, and then the market turned down. And so we built this huge surplus, and so the price went down from 140 down to 26 to $28. Now, if you read the newspapers there, 
All you would have had to do is read the nurse papers and you would have known that you were in a value zone because that's the contrary opinion. All the experts were saying that the oil was going to go down to $20, maybe even in the teens, who knows, whatever. But the point about it is if you looked at the fundamentals today, the oil, the surplus is kind of in balance. The way they measure the surplus is by the number of days of inventory. At the high point, when you have a lot of surplus, you can get 38 days of inventory. And at the low point, it's 25 to 26. The average is about 32. So 32 days of average inventory is when the market is in equilibrium. Then the rest is supply and demand. OK, we are. The average is 32, we are at 30.2, so we are getting into equilibrium where it's even. It's even slightly less than the average, so that's the positive. The other part is that the production is going down dramatically. Throughout the world, they have cut $1 trillion of capital expenditures, so you know, just common sense says that the decline is coming in. So far, the demand, surprisingly, which is surprising everybody, demand keeps going up. And so the demand is going up, the production is going down, the drilling rigs, the percentage of drilling rigs in operation are down 79%. So you know that production is going down. And the projections are today that that average inventory could go down to 26 days by the end of the year, or let's call it nine months, and that would mean that that would be the lowest inventory in 25 years. The other thing you want to look at is that while you hear about the production uh, productivity that they've been able to cut the cost, some people can produce oil at 25 to 35 dollars and so forth. However, if you want to produce 95 billion million barrels a day, which is what we need, you're not going to do it on 50 or 60 dollar oil. The minimum that we require is 60 to 65 dollars. That's the marginal cost of oil. In other words, most companies are not going to go out and drill unless they can make $65 because some people can do it, but there's not enough of that cheap oil to be able to meet the demand. So we have to have a higher price than $65 to $70. And with the way it's going on the production cost, I believe it's my personal opinion by looking at this, talking to the companies, talking to all these people who are very knowledgeable on it, there is the possibility that if they don't start the production soon, that one day we might even have a temporary spike in oil. So the, the opportunities in oil are there, the valuation are still good, and there's opportunities in the stocks and the bonds, and that would be something I would direct your attention in. The next thing I would like to do is cover the gold market. Now, let me say this. I am not a gold bar. I have only owned gold three times in 48 years. I am a value investor and when a market goes down for five straight years and it goes down 85 percent which is what happened to this market you are in market evaluations that only happen two or three percent of the time so buying into the gold market at the turn of the, the turn of the year was like buying into stocks of 1974. The market had gone down five years, 85% down. Anytime a market goes down 65%, you want to dust it off and start looking. But when you got 85% decline, that's pretty extraordinary. But here is a very important statistic, and that is there are $294 trillion worth of assets cash, stocks, and bonds in the world. That's all the assets in the world, not counting real estate. There, all, the, all the gold in the world is only $7 trillion, and half of that is in jewelry and technology. So you only have about $3.5 trillion that is tradable in gold, and it's probably even less. Now, if 1% of the people in the $294 trillion decide to move 1% of their assets into gold, that would be $2.9 trillion. That 1% would be enough to absorb all the gold that's ever been mined in the world. And that is extraordinary. And that is an unusual opportunity. The market has come up quite a bit, so I've cautioned that it's diving in. It's worth looking into. Now, let me just ask talk, take a couple of moments, say, well, what's going to make people buy gold? It's been around for 5,000 years. Why would they buy any more? 
Well, first of all, there's $10 trillion in negative interest rates today. We've never had that in the history of the world, negative interest rates. So there's $10 trillion. There's $12 trillion that has been printed throughout the world. That's another potential. We've got the enormous worldwide debt, and more importantly, we've got worldwide uncertainty. So I really believe that over the next few years, there's going to be a tremendous flow into these gold markets. And let me just say one thing which most people don't realize, and I hear everybody who's critical of gold say, whenever we cut the ties to gold in August of 1971, I'll never forget that day. I didn't think I could ever believe that the United States would cut its link to gold and the dollar. The dollar was always supreme. So we became a fiat currency. If you would have bought gold, which we did at that time, the average return is 7.96% over 44 years. If you bought it 20 years ago, the average return is 6.48. And if you bought it 10 years ago, the average return is about 8%. If you bought it at the top of the market in 211 till now, uh, you would have lost 2.5%. The point I'm making, over any 10 or 20 year period, you're going to make 6 to 9% on your money, irrespective of whether it pays dividend. And I know you could do better, but you could also do worse. And this type of environment, I see it's a great opportunity. It's something you should look into. Don't dive into it right away because it had a big run. But energy and gold are something that are worthwhile as a value investor that you want to look into. I want to summarize this program with these things to summarize the things that I learned through my experience. First of all, always seek the truth. Number two, develop your own set of principles, not the ones you were taught, not the one part of your religion, but the ones that you make and own yourself and the ones you're willing to make a sacrifice for. Be total focused on everything you do so you can not only harness your intelligence, but the greater intelligence of your subconscious mind. It only comes through focusing. And by practicing the principle and following the philosophy and sticking with it, you develop tremendous faith and courage. And that's the kind of thing you need to go through any difficult time that you might have to go through your life. And finally, and the most important one, never give up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arnold. This was uh, very inspirational, and I expected nothing different. So, folks, we're open for questions now. And just a small announcement. Um, after the talk, uh, if somebody wants the books autographed by you, would, it, would that be oh, okay? Sure. So there, there will be some books there, and Arnold will be here to autograph them. Yeah, if I could just take a second to explain the book. Uh, one of my hobbies is collecting quotations. You know, Socrates said, employ your time in reading great people's lives. So you can learn in a very simple way what it took them all their life to, uh, to do. And the best way i found to do that is to quote. Sometime in a quote, you can capture what a person took their whole life to learn. Incredible wisdom through that. And so I have about 5,000 quotes on my computer. And I log them by subject. So wherever I'm studying a subject, I have the chance to read what all the great people thought about it. So, uh, that's, I made a little quote book on that, and I'd like to share that with you. The second book is A Poverty to Power. It's one of the most extraordinary books that I have read over my career. I've been reading it for over 30 years. And when I went to the publisher and said, I wanted to buy a big volume because I wanted to get them out to friends, family, and clients, he said, oh, we only publish about 25 books. So I thought, 25 books, a book this great? Anyway, the reason I recommend this book is because this gentleman, James Allen, is one person that has spent his whole life seeking truth. And he searched it through all the different cultures, religions, you can't imagine. And I have never had a problem where I couldn't find the answer in that book. So I hope you'll use that as a source for your time. Thank you, Arnold. Questions? Well, thanks for coming. It was really great to hear you talk. Uh, just a so as a value investor, what do you do when you don't see an opportunity in the market? Do you, what's your stance on cash? As a value investor, what do you do when you don't have any options? If over the 
40 years or so that Century Man's been in business, our average cash position was 20%. I always felt that holding back cash, even when there's great opportunities, there's always opportunities to go along. So we've always had a higher cash position than most people. But in a time when there are great values, we have a little less cash. Today, I feel one of the best cash items is gold. And so we don't have as much cash, but we do have a lot more in the gold market. So the answer is cash. Even if cash doesn't make any money, it's better than losing money. So you have to be patient. And that's one of the principles you learn is patient pays off. One thing I can tell you of being 48 years in the business, you will always, you will always find values if you're patient. You might have to wait a year and a half. You might have to wait two years. But my God, what I went through writing this thing down for six years, I wouldn't wish that on the worst human being. That's a terrible thing to do, to come to the office every day and just get beat up. It's, it's just like a torture. So if you're not sure, if you don't have a great opportunity, it's better to take no interest than a loss. I'm just curious about your and Apple. Um, it's like the world's biggest company. The, the P is probably at like 10. If you minus out the cash up or seven PE and meanwhile all the other tech companies are way higher like Microsoft and so the question is about Apple um, it's a low PE about 10 and they have a lot of cash on their balance sheet so if you take the cash out it's even lower PE in effect how do you think about that because all other tech companies are selling at more expensive prices well I think by all criteria you would have a great value uh, the question that I have, and I'm sorry that I can't give you a definitive answer because we don't follow it, we're not in it, but the thing is from all standpoints, just from a cursory standpoint, you're right about the cash. If you took it on, it'd be cheaper. They've got all these opportunities. They've got a lot of money in, in the bank. But my question is, what are they going to do for the future? That's the most important thing. And I'm not qualified to answer that because I'm not a te technical person. But if I was looking at the company and we've looked at it back and forth, the thing that I have a big question mark is, what are they going to do into the future? Because you can have a low PE as long as you have a less than 10 times cash flow, you got a 10% cash flow return. And so you could keep this even if it didn't go up, if the price didn't go up, the value keeps going up and it pushes the price up. So I wouldn't fault anybody for saying this is an extraordinary bargain, but the question I have, and you would be able to answer that better than I do, is what is the future? And I remember one of my analysts came to me and he says, Arnold, we ought to look at Apple, and it was the highest capitalization in the market. And I said, you know, Bill, I said, it's been my experience when a company gets to be the biggest capitalization in the history of the market, if you look at the next five to 10 years, the performance isn't all that great. Now that's not a judgment on the company, but when it's so big, it's bigger than anything around, what's gonna, what's gonna, what do they have to do to create that growth to keep it going? So it's a very good question. I wish I could give you the answer. If I could, I'd probably buy it. So unfortunately, we're out of time, but I hope there'll be Time to continue this conversation outside as we as oh, we sure. So thank you everyone.